Hi everyone, my name is Beth Wilson and welcome back to my video series, The Power of Storytelling. In each episode, I invite a guest to share stories that will help us understand discrimination and inequality in order that we all might learn and grow. I hope through the video series that you walk away inspired by some incredible people and feel equipped with some resources to help you lead your own transformational storytelling conversations. I'm really excited today to welcome a wonderful colleague and client, a female leader who is full of passion, energy, enthusiasm, um, and an all round superstar actually in the financial services sector. Bindu Kujo is a lawyer by training and built her career at Bay Street Law Firms in Toronto. She then shifted in-house with a move to BMO in their general counsel team. And for the past two years, she's been at Canadian Western Bank as Senior Vice President, General Counsel and Corporate Secretary. There, she's leading a team to provide legal, corporate governance and regulatory solutions across the bank. And when she's not tackling all of those challenges in the financial sector, she's working hard on initiatives with the National General Counsel Network, an organization that she founded with a group of other racialized general counsel or she's working as a director on one of several boards. And to add to all of those accomplishments, she's also 2020 President's Award recipient from the Women General Council of Canada, amongst many, many other awards and recognition. Too much to list here, but needless to say, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Bindu to the podcast today. Bindu, hi. Hello, Beth. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Yeah, I am really looking forward to our conversation today. I know it's going to be uh, terrific. So let's start by looking back on 2020. You know, that was a really challenging year for communities in Canada, um, particularly the events leading up to the groundswell of anti-racism movements. So as you reflect back on 2020, how did that unfold for you? Uh have done lots of reflecting on 2020 and 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 this is one of the threads that I remember the most from it one it and and just the fact that you know with all of us locked in our homes and all of us sort of seeing what was unfolding across the world and it, and it felt like we were all just a little bit more fragile and and it was harder to to cope with and and maybe because it's the 24-hour news cycle and we had nothing else to do right we weren't really supposed to be outside we weren't supposed to be doing these pieces um and so it was you know, it was, it, it took away your kind of ability to ignore it because it was just so all present and in your face. Um, and it was so overwhelming and yet in some crazy way, so heartening that it seemed like finally this, this message about racial inequality, that racial inequality was like in the faces of the vast majority of the majority. And, and it was just felt like there was this strange um, moment in time where, you know, we had it go from, you know, talking about diversity is a good thing and it's important to be diverse to all of a sudden talking about oppression and discrimination and racism and all these very heavy, serious words. But we were having a conversation about these things for the first time more broadly in our society. You know, things like Black Lives Matter, which, you know, I'll fully admit uh, a couple of years earlier what was too too out there for me. Like it, I, I couldn't quite get behind some of these issues, even though I very much was uh, alive to the fact um, both through my personal life and, and just as being kind of a member of society that, you know, members of the black community have a different experience as it exists again with policing and other societal structures. But, but suddenly Black Lives Matter became more mainstream. It became something that everybody or a lot of people could get behind and get comfortable with. Um, and, and I think that those events and, and the fact that frankly, there was a nine minute video shown on TikTok a, mil, a billion times over, um, really became a catalyst to get some conversations going from the fringes and into daily parlance to become a topic of conversation, um, you know, amongst friends, amongst work colleagues, amongst peers, that it wasn't, you know, a conversation that you had in a radicalized corner, it was, it became more mainstream. You know, when you when you talked about things moving from the generic to the specific, right, from talk to action for everybody, uh, that really resonated with me, right? So white female leader in a position of power and a position of privilege from both of those lenses um, and always have considered myself an ally. My question for you is, um, how have your comment, how have, how have your conversations changed with 
uh, people who consider themselves allies and and how do you see allyship uh, shifting? Because I know I've certainly asked myself the question as a result of all of this and, and done my own journey of, of learning and, and understanding around white privilege and anti-racism. But am I am I doing am I doing what I should be doing as an ally? Um, what should I be doing differently as an ally? Um, what did I guess? What are you, what, how are those conversations shifting for you? And what advice are you giving? people that come to you and ask you that question or other leaders even in, in yeah. CWB? Yeah, I listen, I, I think it's a great question. Um, I think what has really shifted is that there's such a desire, like there's so much more curiosity being shown in, I think, through allyship now. And, and I don't mean to suggest it wasn't there before, but I, I feel like it, there may have been a bit of a feeling like if you didn't, know what those issues were because you were educated or or whatnot that it wasn't okay to talk about it or to ask right like you, you should come to the table fully formed uh and and you know really um rich in your allyship and understand everything uh and i think what's an really evolved human being right yes yes a superior human it's being a pretty high species. bar pretty yeah. high bar bindu <laughs> but i felt like there were times where and i would say that even as i'm trying to understand because uh, I'm an ally to other people too, right? Like, I, believe me, I, I don't have it all. Like, I haven't won. It's one of my favorite phrases. I have not won the oppression Olympics, right? Like, I still have lots of privilege. I still got lots of things that, you know, make my life a little bit easier. But, you know, I think there was a feeling like you kind of, it wasn't okay to really ask questions and to explore, or maybe it was, but people felt uncomfortable. But I think so much of the narrative over the last number of months about what is allyship and what it means. It's, it's about being curious. It's about asking questions. It's about listening. And it's about letting, you know, uh, encouraging people to have a voice to speak their truth, their lived experience. Um, and I would observe that that active listening piece is really key. Like the number of forums that either people have been creating for themselves or leaders and organizations or organizations have been creating for, for their folks or just the number of places to even talk about these issues have, has kind of exploded. Like, you know, we might've done this conversation at a different point in time and it would have, you know, taken 18 months of scheduling and, and, and then there would have been 20 people in the room and we may have recorded, you know, it would just would have been a different way to have this conversation, but now we're going to have this and and it will be bigger than, yeah. than the few people that could be in the room with us. But I think the, the nature of the conversations, the frequency of them, the fact that they're a lot more exploratory um, and, and they're filled with a bit of an urgency. Like there, there were moments where sometimes the conversations felt like you, there was a bit of box ticking with like, okay, you know, I've been enlightened, enlightenment done for the month. Like I'm good, right? I got my, I, I'm maxed out. Um, but I feel like this, this urgency that's going with it isn't just in folks like me who are talking about my experience, but like great allies like you, Beth, who want to do something. Like it's not enough to just let it be, right? Or to just say, okay, like I've learned I'm a bit more woke and let's get back to the, right. you know, the task at hand or the next email in my inbox. Right. So I think, I think that's important. Certainly we found inside Denton's, we've been doing these uh, discussions to disrupt uh, series and uh, it's been it's been incredible in terms of that listening and, and people sharing their stories. Um, Bindu, maybe you would shift gears a, a little bit to the personal uh, for a moment. Your passion for inclusion and diversity really comes through. Um, and this, some, this is something I've sort of known about you for a while and I've seen it. Where does that where does that come from in terms of your own history? And and then how does that translate into your working life? Sure. So um, if, if I think back to my life, I mean, I, I was born and raised in, well, I wasn't born in Calgary. I was brought up in Calgary um, in, a, in a pretty homogenous neighborhood, very middle-class neighborhood. Um, there were only a handful of, of uh, kids that went to my school that weren't white. Um, in fact, there were, uh, I, I think I mentioned this to you, I think there were like four sets of us, we were siblings, two, two pairs of siblings. And uh, and I still remember all of their names. And I remember how much we stuck out uh, at this school, but that was, that was our world and that was our life, right? And so, you know, in many ways, I would say my 
my beginnings were about a story of assimilation, right? Of, of mm -hmm. as a strategy of survival. So, you know, you, you want to try to blend in as best as possible, but you know that you're different because that there are some, some kinds of differences that are hard to hide, uh, if, if that were even a thing, but you just acknowledge that you were different. Um, and, you know, again, growing up in, in the eighties in Calgary, there wasn't a ton of diversity there. Um, but, uh, I found, early days for me, humor was a way to get through the stuff that felt painful at times, right? Or when when difference became a, 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 a thing that maybe came up between people that I could use humor to do that. And I, frankly, it's been the tool that I've, I've used through many parts of my, my life. Um, but then I moved to Toronto and, uh, and then it was a different kind of sticking out. So in Calgary, I was sort of so I felt like I was so rare as like a South Asian person, even though it definitely wasn't that case by the time I left Calgary in the 90s. But when I came to Ontario, there were so many South Asian people that in fact, you started, you, I found in those communities that there was like cleaving down certain language lines, and maybe even cast lines and all these weird things that I was just like, whoa, like I had no idea we had such a such a population, such a size of population that we could actually start discriminating amongst ourselves, right? And dividing amongst ourselves, which is kind of a, a terrible thing. But then I went to law school and, um, and, you know, while there was a little bit more diversity there, it, it hadn't been like undergrad where there had been a lot more. Um, and, you know, you sort of started to find some of your like-minded folks in law school, I got involved in a lot of diversity initiatives as they then were. Uh, I, I got to go to Yale and I saw Kimberly Crenshaw speak and talk about intersectionality and my mind was blown and oh my gosh, law and racism. And it was just, it was so incredible. And then I joined the working world and uh, and then, you know, I kind of had to go back to conformity or at least I felt like conformity was going to be the way that I was going to survive and thrive. I didn't understand Bay Street. I really didn't know it. I didn't grow up on it. I, you know, I, I aspired to it. I mean, that that's a marker of success, right? Is to practice law on Bay Street. Um, but, you know, I still remember a conversation sort of when I was in law school about, um, you know, Bay Street and Bay Street life. And, and one of the women lawyers sort of said to me, you, you need to do something with your hair because it's just too big. Like you, you're not going to survive and you're not going to thrive in Bay Street if you don't kind of tame your hair down. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, why am I feeling like I'm back and I'm 13 and I wish I had straight hair that I could crimp because that was so awesome. Um, but you know, why am I back there? And here I am. I'm like, I'm a, I'm, I'm this educated, like success. I'm, I hope to be a successful lawyer, but suddenly starting to feel like I needed to sort of make myself a little bit smaller and make myself a little bit more part of a container. Um, and, and I did that for a while, right? I, I, I did it to cope, to survive, to make it through, to get through articling, to become an associate, you focus on my work, my work will be excellent. They're going to love me for that. Then there's no way anybody could knock my credentials if I'm really good at my job. Uh, and, and, but, but then the world starts changing, right? And so we start to move from this place of conformance, assimilation to talking about diversity. It becomes a thing, you know, corporate Canada starts talking about the fact that there might be some value in recognizing that, that difference can bring different perspectives to organizations and that teams with diversity performed better. Um, but we still were at a place where it was like, well, that's what we're hearing anecdotally, but you're going to have to build the business case for, you know, why we might want to introduce diversity in some way into our organization. And I would say certainly at the beginning of that, you know, I was in, in law, in a law firm and I don't, you know, I'm not disparaging it, but it was, it's an evolution and thinking, right. The, where we started there is not where I thought we'd be talking about anti-oppression work that needs to be done, right? Like that with, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, that was unheard of. Um, but we were still talking about the need to build the business case to justify supporting diversity. Um, and, you know, we still needed proof that in fact, diverse teams drove higher performance. Um, and we still needed our clients to kind of bang us over the head a little bit to say, oh, this is important to us. But our clients weren't being very loud about it yet, right? They, they might've been putting it in their, in their, in their corporate values, but they weren't really doing too much about it. But it was around that time that I shifted and I moved in house. And so I became part, of, I became a client and I, I, I moved uh, into an organization. And, you know, I still remember very early days when I arrived at BMO and, and the general counsel convened a meeting and he announced that the business case for diversity had been made. And we weren't going to talk about that anymore. Like we were done. We know that diversity is good for business. So now let's talk about how we 
you know, encourage diversity, have diversity thrive, at really talking about the, the ideas and the concepts that are what we would now call inclusion, right? So how do we right. take a whole bunch of, you know, representative individuals and make them hum, like make this, like make them sing and, and be able to work together. So the language is a do it has changed, right? So, you know, it's ta talking about, you know, getting the best out of people, making them feel comfortable, making them thrive, not necessarily focusing on who's being excluded, but reinforcing that everybody should be included. And, and to me, that was deeply powerful because to uh, that's the piece of inclusion that was really exciting to me, right? That together we would be better, that more all of our ideas, bringing our different perspectives, that that's where innovation is going to happen. And I'm I, I'm so excited by innovation and change and, you know, making things better creatively or in big leaps. I'm not always talking about invention, but rather just making it a bit better. Um, and so for me, that was like, you know, oh, like this is the reason why the power of all of us coming together with our different ideas and thoughts. It's not about having representation from every single group here. It's about actually, you know, not only having representatives and, and having that, but but then getting the best out of all of us, right? Like activating that, that's exciting. Um, and so I've loved as we've shifted from diversity to, to inclusion, but now it's about equity. And that is, you know, right. it's one of those concepts yeah. that I for sure learned about in law school. Um, and boy, has it ever like become so relevant in the moment as we talk about vaccine rollout and distribution. And we see things that have been done to be equal and how they really haven't been equitable and how they've had an unintended impact on other groups or not the intended impact on other groups. Um, but that piece around equity, right? That it's not enough to just say we value difference and we will try to make everybody feel included. But it's the next step, which says that there are going to be some groups, some people in our society, in our organizations at a moment in time, maybe forever, like who knows, but that they will have uh, like an undue burden that, and that we will actually have to do something right. disruptive, specific and interventionist in order to write the course, right? right? It we'll may involve decide. like consciously reallocating yes. resources, right? Reallocating right. and redirecting resources, whether in our organizations or in your philanthropy or wherever the case may be. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And I, I think that that's really important. Like that's a big shift because, you know, it's nice to talk about rising ties will float all boats. And I think that that has worked to some degree, but let's be clear. Like if women have been 50 and they have been 50% of the population since the dawn of time. Um, and yet, you know, we continue to have to do targeted, specific, disruptive, deliberate things in order to make change. And even that hasn't worked, right? But ha hasn't been as successive. So there's no way we're gonna do this, you know, on a, on a race-based level or any other kind of level, unless we sort of take those pieces. And, and it's constantly talking people back from affirmative action, right? Like that, that whole concept just got such a bad rap in the 60s when it was actually very much about creating equity. It just got tied up with, merit or unfairly tied up with merit and people still bring it up like they still want to say but of course we need to have the most qualified candidate okay we don't need to talk about that piece of it of course like no one's compromising on the quality but maybe we will save some opportunity for certain groups so bindu i have um that's amazing your your insights are are really incredible i know i know people listening to this are going to take away a lot to the point on vulnerability there's a different level of vulnerability when you're talking about, I think, your experiences in the workplace or your experiences coming through law school versus sharing uh, the impact that racism has had on you as a person or from a family perspective. And when you and I were talking, you talked a little bit about that in terms of the impact, particularly over the last year um, and before that, uh, racism and how that plays out inside your household um as a as a spouse as a mom uh, can you share a few thoughts in that regard give us a little insight into how this is playing out in the in the Cujo household these days yeah yeah well I'm happy to and it isn't always a place that I go so uh my husband was uh is of Ghanaian like West African heritage um raised kind of all over the world. And, uh, but, you know, obviously here we are in, in Canada together and, and uh, uh, we've got three kids. So a daughter, uh, they're all teenagers. So 
Thank you. I just survived. A <laughs> That's a whole other down. podcast. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Exactly. So, and they're, but they're, they're wonderful. So I've got a 16 year old daughter, 14 year old and 12 year old boys. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a really, it was such an interesting time to be locked in a house together with young people who, however they see themselves tend to be identified as black. So um, my daughter will say, so my, my mom lives with us as well. And, and aren't we lucky to have her? But I, I think maybe when, when school was in session, um, she went, my mom who wears Sari, South Indian, wears a Sari, went to go pick up my daughter from high school. And a couple of her friends were like, why is that Indian lady waving at you? Like, who, who's that? And she's like, oh, that's my grandma. And they all kind of looked at her and they were like, but you're black. Like, how is that your grandmother? Um, and so my kids are identified as, as black or they identify as black. And I think they feel a lot more kinship with that to some degree, because frankly, the world sees them that way. Um, so, you know, as we're sitting locked in the house and we're watching all of this stuff unfold again, none of which is happening for the first time. Right. But, but there's that George Floyd video and I, I'd, I'd heard about it, but I hadn't really seen it. And to be honest, there's a self-preservation piece to that. Right. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that sounds awful. I'm not certain. I really want to see it. But my 13 year old at the time is on TikTok. And he's on TikTok all the time. And apparently there's different kinds of TikTok. I didn't know this, uh, but he's on TikTok. That's very sort of Black Lives Matter. And he's watching this video and he's like furious. He's enraged. What, how can this happen? How th- this is, and he's like, you know, he's sharing statistics. He's talking about all of this stuff. He's also got lots of other stuff going on about US politics. But my 11 year old came and he said, everyone's talking about this video and I want to see it, but I'm scared. And so we sat down together and we watched this video. I bawled because this is like the most horrible thing that could be happening. Like somebody's being murdered on film. It's not a movie. And there's four community helpers who that's what my children have been told, like growing up in lovely Oakville and, and, and uh, that these are community helpers, that they're people you go to when you need help, like they're going to make you safe. And, and they're doing this, they're murdering this person and, or, or Three of them are standing by and watching it happen. What a conversation to have with my kid. What a terrible thing to want to, that my child really needed to see, but was like scared to see. And, you know, that led as it needs to, and unfortunately as it did to a whole bunch of conversations with our three kids, but in particular with our boys about, you know, we live here and we have all kinds of privilege from living here and we have every right to live here, but in our neighborhood, I'm not certain if you're going to be, you're going to be treated with the same right to live here. So if there is a gift out of this, it's, it's, it's like, it's that I ha- I get to have these conversations with my children without the disruption and interruptions of like the busyness of our lives that, you know, when I could schedule a conversation to talk about race relations with my children um, during a very busy month of travel and otherwise, but we're all together. So we can, we can have those and we can kind of test each other on that. Um, but yeah, it, it hasn't, it hasn't exactly been easy. And I realized that's a different experience. The other thing that I would say that was really exciting and, and is watching Kamala Harris become vice president. And I looked at my daughter and I said, she's you, like she's Blindian, like she's black and she's, Indian. <laughs> in fact, she's even South Indian, like, oh my God. And, you know, cause she's 16, my daughter rolled her eyes at me and was like, okay, whatever. Like, could you stop being so excited about this? But what a thing, like there has never been anyone like my daughter, like in that world. Like, okay, everyone tells me like, they'll be like, you're like Oprah. I'm like, but Oprah's black. Like she's had a very different experience than me, but there's not a lot of people that are like me in positions of power and that sort of thing. And yet to have somebody like Kamala Harris be there to hopefully inspire my daughter or other girls like her or other people. Anyways, it's, I, there's been some cool, cool moments, some lowlights and some highlights, right? Well, Bindu, I'll tell you what's inspirational and that's, that's you. So (laughs) I think uh, if you want to talk about gifts, thank you for sharing your time with me today and, uh, and everybody who will watch this and, uh, and what a gift for your children to have, uh, to have a mom like you and, and your organizations to have a leader like you. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing with us today. It's been truly amazing. Uh, one last thing before we close off, 
Is there a book, a podcast, an article, any resource you want to leave our listeners with as they continue their journeys? Um, there was one that I spent a bit of time exploring, partly because I wanted to think about how to talk about race with my kids. And so it's um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and they have a whole series that's called Talking About Race. And I actually think if if you're starting to learn, or even if you're a well-advanced, if you're an advanced learner in the space, I always think looking at the resources that are kind of geared towards children are sometimes, or especially teens, are really thought-provoking good ones, right? Because they kind of take it back to, to the origins of what we're talking about here, and they don't get so caught up in all these other assumptions. So anyways, I thought there were some wonderful resources Great. there, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for inviting oh, me. Thanks very much. Take care. Okay, bye.